Sports Hard Drive Recovery experts want you to send them a very big check and trust their in-house data recovery gnomes to use magic to make your data reappear after the check clears. Scott Moulton is a little different. He wants his money if he's recovering a drive for you, <laughs> but he's into teaching people and occasionally three-letter agencies how to recover data. And yes, he recovers data. His company, Forensic Strategy, and it's, it's in myharddrivedie.com. If you go to one of your seminars, you get like 1,200 pages of information, including, I think, where is it? The You're actually the, probably the first person I heard about this. Where is it, where is it, where is it? The myths about hard drives. Freezing hard drives will save your data, true and false. Yes, it, it will actually work, but uh, obviously it depends on the type of damage that you have for your drive, whether or not it will work or not. Usually it's things like contacts or something where a pen mm -hmm. might not be making contact, and then when you freeze it, it'll actually cause contact to actually uh, touch the board or something like that where it will actually work. But it will also cause damage as well. So it's really not, yeah, condensation, all kinds of other damage. So it is not very scientific. It is not the best method for doing data recovery. It's like the last resort if you have no hardware, no equipment, and no skills to do it. Then, you know, putting it in a freezer may be the one shot you have if you're not going to send it anyplace. If you're right. not playing, if it's not critical data. But you'd be surprised at how often I hear that this is priceless data, and then you tell them price, and then it's not priceless anymore. So, you know, things like that happen. Actually, it turns out the price is lower than that. Well, let's talk about what's, what's new in data recovery. Well, the biggest things are uh, we have two major things that have basically happened. One is uh, imaging by MFTs, mm -hmm. basically on Windows systems, which are the majority of recoveries, using the actual MFT itself to be more surgical mm -hmm. in what you actually are recovering so that you're not having to image a whole drive or trying to deal with the entire disk itself. So what's the, what's the MFT for everybody playing along The MFT home? is the master file table. It's basically in a Windows formatted drive in NTFS. It is the catalog of where your files are and what files you have. So mm -hmm. Like the My Documents list is actually a list inside of a catalog. Mm -hmm. And when you choose that, it'll calculate where the clusters are based on the uh, logical block addresses for where that file is. But I'm at home, my hard drive dies. After I finish panicking, what's the first thing I should do? Obviously, we've just learned, do not immediately run it to the freezer with a USB cable, like, cable dangling out. Right. What's the first thing I should do? Well, the very first thing is you can use, and I have done some videos and some conferences to try to help people do data recovery themselves, mm -hmm. but more to understand what that problem was so you can kind of evaluate what that problem is yourself. So there's differences in where the drive is. So your first option is, do I want to try to do something myself and not spend any money, or is it really critical? critical data, do I want to spend some money and actually get this data back? Because then you draw that line, you say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do something myself or I will cause detrimental uh, death to this drive <laughs> and never be able to recover it. And you become a disk destroyer instead of a data recovery. Because if you definitely, absolutely, positively have to have those TPF reports back, you should yes, probably you send it out. <laughs> if you need the TPS reports, you should probably consider sending it out. Uh, because there is a lot to data recovery. It's not just a matter of, I've got some software and I run it on a disk and I do something. There's a the difference between a hardware problem mm -hmm. and a software problem. And so, you know, if you get if your machine starts to boot and Windows crashes, well then you probably you may have some bad sectors, but at least you can see data. So right. once you've actually got to that point, there's a high probability it's not a firmware problem or some other horrible thing, a, you know, a, a dead head or something on your drive if you can get that far. Um, it's when it clicks or clunks or something like that and it makes Horrible different sounds. Horrible grinding sounds. Horrible grinding sounds. There's a bunch of things about how it responds. And I've actually been trying to give people that information. So I've done some videos that are out on YouTube and off of myharddrivedie.com to teach you how to know what type of problem you have when it dies so that you can kind of make that determination yourself. So how do, where should we start? To, to, if, if we hear the clunking, grinding, threshing noises, it's probably time to call in a professional? Yeah, it really depends on how you're connected to the machine first mm -hmm. off. So in this particular instance, as you can see, what I have in front of me is I actually have a motherboard, and I'm connected directly to the motherboard, with a, and I have a piece of equipment here in addition to that. But if I was trying to do data recovery myself, there's a big difference between using a USB off of, say, a laptop or off of a desktop and using a motherboard and directly connecting to it. There are free utilities, like uh, MHDD is one of them, mm -hmm. uh, and it comes from hddguru.com, and then there's another one called Victoria, and it will help you determine some of the problems with your drive, but you really need to be connected to your motherboard and not through USB. USB, people forgot USB sucks. <laughs> USB is like, you know, how to get an accessory on your machine. It's not great for data recovery because you can't control the command set that's talking to the motherboard, the ATA command set. Okay. So if you look that up, you'll actually see that you can actually apply commands to talk to the drive, and most software equipment will do that. 
but not through USB. Those got things it. don't work. So I've uh, got it connected to my hard drive, or my hard drive's connected to my motherboard, it doesn't work. What's the next level? Uh, the next thing I would do is actually use a DOS utility. This is mm -hmm. called MHDD. And MHDD would be, you would basically use a floppy or CD-ROM and you'd boot on it. And then you could actually see the drive itself and see whether or not it responds. There's, a, there's basically a command that says, I started the drive and I've got a busy signal. And then the busy signal actually, it's very similar to like a modem. Mm -hmm. It'll actually respond to me and you can actually get back errors and you can get back certain kinds of information from a sector when it's red. And so typically, most of the tools that we've used up till now have been pretty uh, dumb. Blunt. <laughs> yeah, they don't really tell you any errors. They just say, I tried to read your drive. Sorry, I failed. Whereas a piece of software that actually understands the drive can actually request a sector, get back a particular type of error, and tell you what type of error that is, rather than just, you know, I'm dumb and I don't know anything. This particular tool is called the Deep Spar Disk Imager. It's one of the best tools for doing data recovery because it does some other things too, like if you have a clunking drive and you have a bad head, you can actually turn off one bad head that would have taken you three weeks to copy a drive. And you can turn off the bad head and get just the files that you want from the other sections. Because of this particular function it has for turning off bad heads, it's the only thing in this price range that will actually do it. After you go up to the next tools, it's all firmware stuff that actually starts dealing with head masks and things like that to turn them off. And this particular tool actually is kind of like a bit torrent for hard drives. It'll actually start building a list and anything that shows up green in these particular boxes will be a good copy. It'll be actually a good thing that it's actually copying. And it will make multiple passes. It will go forward, then it will go in reverse, and it'll try to whittle down any errors. And anything that's green, if there's a problem, it will skip the problems and it will mark them with a different color. And then it'll come back and whittle those down so that you can just skip those bad blocks and come back and get those bad blocks later. So you're not spending all this effort actually doing something else, uh, grinding on a sector that might be damaged. Because most imaging tools start at the beginning and then they go to a spot where they actually fail. And then once they fail, they don't continue on. So you'll end up with bad blocks or something else that it's actually talking to. What, what happens if, so I've taken it out of the USB or I've tried it on a second motherboard just in case the first motherboard's flaky, and it seems like the hard drive's dead. Either it doesn't want to boot up, I get a grinding noise, then what happens? Well, from that standpoint, and when you actually power on the drive and you've powered it on and you've used something like MHDD to boot on, then the issue is there will be a command that will say busy, and then it will go from busy to drive seat complete and drive ready. And you will get two other commands that will basically say, I've at least responded and I've read part of the disk. And there's three pieces of major information that you're looking for. One would be the model number, the serial number, and then the third one being the uh, LBA blocks. How what's your geometry? Are, you, are we going to now talk about transferring platters to a new enclosure? <laughs> well, we would. We would. That would be the step if you know we actually had like a motor that didn't spin. We actually got to a spot where it never comes ready. And in a lot of cases, if the motor doesn't spin and you can't get it to actually come ready, it'll give you like a phaser sound. It'll sound a little bit like Star Trek. It'll go. Ee, 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 ee. And you'll get like a weird Heard that sound. that one too. <laughs> yeah. So it'll sound a little bit like that. And basically that means that the platters aren't moving and the head can't, can't move. And so you're not able to seek any, any information at all on the disc. So in a lot of cases that does mean I've got some sort of a motor problem or my heads are stuck to the platter. We have this old problem that's still back. It's called stiction, mm -hmm. where your head sticks to the platter and then the platter can't turn. So it's still a possibility there. Uh, I do have to caution people about just opening drives from a standpoint of Western Digital drives. Western Digital drives have a head that's actually attached to the lid. And if you just arbitrarily opened it, and, and clean rooms aside, or what are the other right. issues with clean rooms, uh, the or lid- Or lack thereof. <laughs> or lack thereof. It is possible to do a data recovery without a clean room, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a whole list of arbitrary things that you need to understand before you do that. But if I, was, if I had practiced enough, and I was really good at it, I may still be able to open the drive, get it to spin, and then put it back together, get my data off of it, and throw the drive away. But if it's a Western Digital drive, you should not open it. The, the, the lid itself is actually what is used for the alignment for the head assembly. Mm -hmm. And most of the new Western Digital drives all have a board problem. And so it'll sound like a head problem, and it'll kind of make this you know, clicking in, or a slightly grinding sound, but it's all a board problem. Uh, there's a failure on the board, and then you actually have to use some high-end tool to copy the ROM so that you can put it on a good board and oh, use wow. the board. But it acts like a head problem. That's got to be really frustrating. I mean, I, Veronica and I both use a lot of Western Digital products. We've been pretty happy. But so, so Western Digital is now having some, some diode issues on some of the PCBs. Are there specific lines that are having the issues? Or? Um, I have seen it in almost all of the new perpendicular lines, all the stuff that's been around for like the last year and a half, two mm -hmm. years or so. Uh, so you know, for instance, this particular one that's in front of me is a Western Digital 500 AAKS. Mm -hmm. This one would be one that would have that problem. In a lot of cases, they have this uh, triangular board on the bottom. 
Got it. And this particular triangular board is, is a good indication of, of when you might actually have a board failure <laughs> and not really a head failure. This is why we're always talking about backing up your backup. So how's yes. Seagate doing? They had massive firmware problems yeah. that were for, for yeah, a Yeah, at uh, oh. Christmas of 2008 to yeah. January 2008, they had some massive firmware problems. And there was two or three different firmware problems. Most of that has been fixed and most of it we can get around. Mm -hmm. So most of it, if you have a Seagate drive now that actually has a failure, it is possible for us to do the data recovery by doing a, a weird kind of firmware update. Okay, one thing before we go, solid state drives. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there, if a solid state drive crashes, is there data recovery or is it a paperweight? Um, it is a very difficult task. I've been spending about a year and a half doing solid state recoveries and trying to get to the spot where, you know, the original concept was that we could use a, a, the chip. We could take the chip off, we could read the chip, and then try to reassemble them. That's that not trivial. Very, no, it is not trivial. That is like, <laughs> if you've ever assembled a RAID array, it's like that times 100 mm -hmm. for even a simple one. Uh, but most solid state failures are not the actual chip or or a cracked board. They're usually some sort of a diode or resistor or a, what's called TVSs on the board itself. So most of the time you can try to figure out what it is, but in a lot of cases you might need a meter or an oscilloscope or something mm -hmm. to do that, but you have to compare it to a good one in a lot of cases too. So that's the hard part. But it is possible to do recoveries, but most of them are actually doing board repairs. Uh, similar to what we might do in hard drives when we actually have like a PCB board that gets smoked. We got to go, where do people find more information? What's the best website? Um, the best place to go is myharddrivedive.com and mm -hmm. I have a, a presentation page where you can go and see do-it-yourself stuff and I also have a classes page and, uh, and coincidentally I'm having a class in San Francisco in two months and I have San Diego in a couple of weeks. Cool. So anybody that's on this coast, um, look out for those classes on the presentations or on the uh, classes page. Ladies and gentlemen, I can promise you he doesn't talk quite so fast in the presentations because he doesn't have me pushing him along. Scott Moulton, people, myharddrivedive.com. Great information on data recovery. Check it out.